Hi everyone, I'm excited today to kick off the third appointment of our Astra Fireside Chats, a series, a series of short interviews with prominent VCs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders from all around the world. Briefly about Astra Incubator. Astra is a 10-week startup incubation program targeting student founders and recent graduates in Italy. Astra just launched its first incubation batch two weeks ago and is currently incubating 20 startups featuring speakers from some of the major Italian startups and VC firms. I'm Francesco, a Berkeley graduate and product manager in a Silicon Valley startup. With me, Ileana Pirozzi, Stanford PhD with multiple experiences in, in venture investing. And um, we have a great guest today. Ileana, would you like to introduce us uh, to our guest? Grazie, Francesco. Uh, I already know this intro won't do him justice, but here I go. Um, Many refer to Steve Blank as the father of modern entrepreneurship, and that's because of the great influence he's had over the past 20 years on the way that we think about and execute entrepreneurial endeavors in the United States and beyond. Steve is a serial entrepreneur, an author, an educator, a professor at UC Berkeley and Stanford University. Uh, but in addition to being a successful as well as a failed entrepreneur, Steve is the creator of the customer development model and the developer of the Lean Launchpad model, which is uh, the model that actually Astra is based on. So Steve and I met over a year ago when we started discussing the topic of technical founders and sci founders with scientific backgrounds and brainstorming ways of supporting them. A year later, I am truly blessed with the opportunity to call Steve a mentor and a teacher as I will be embarking in Stanford's very own Lean Launchpad next month to learn about how to commercialize the technology from my doctorate research. And I just wanna say that people like Steve just see the world in a different way. And sometimes those are very powerful ways and I know that Steve inspired me to tell my story, and I can only hope that his words will do the same uh, for our audience today. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you, Steve. Thanks for having me, Francisco and Ilana. I'm, I'm excited to, to talk to uh, uh, entrepreneurs in Italy. Thank you, Steve. So about a year ago, you told me, and this is something that you say a lot, that entrepreneurs are like artists. They see things that others don't see and they hear things that others don't hear. Uh, and we also talked about the fact that um, most famously in our own country, Italy, um, in the Renaissance, artists use the model of apprenticeship, um, which would make one thing that art can be taught. Um, but we also know that being entrepreneurial is different than being a founder in a similar way that being creative is different than being an artist. So what would you say are today's models of apprenticeship uh, for people that are interested in entrepreneurship? How can they figure out what their role can be within a startup? Um, and maybe this is a more philosophical question. I know your mind has changed over the years about this, but do you think today that entrepreneurship can be taught? Well, let's start with the last one because um, I, I, I have been thinking about that for a couple of decades and, and we could use the artist metaphor uh, and, and use some parallels. Uh, you know, as you pointed out, uh, in the Renaissance, uh, you know, people who were aspiring artists uh, apprenticed. And, and that was kind of the model for about four or 500 years. And, and even today, if you want to be a great artist, depending on your field, you might want to go to Juilliard for music or, you know, other famous art schools uh, around the world and in Italy, et cetera, or for music or for writing, et cetera. But something happened about 100, maybe 150 years ago, is we also decided for society, it was great to teach art to everyone, including children, to make, you know, little ashtrays or finger paint or put on plays or whatever. And that did two things. One is it exposed the masses to art so they could appreciate art. We called it art appreciation, but it did something else. It actually let budding artists identify at a very early age that this is a possible career. You mean, you mean I could be an artist? I could be a writer or a composer or a musician or dancer? And, and, and from five years on, you could decide that that's your passion. Um, I think the same thing is true for, for entrepreneurship. Um, I think what we've been missing is uh, entrepreneurship appreciation for the masses. I think everybody should take a entrepreneurship class as early as possible, not just in, 
university or college or high school or grade school, but everywhere to both appreciate what these crazy creative people can do, but this time in business, but also to self-identify that says, huh, well, maybe I want to do that. Um, because most of us discover that much later in life. And uh, I think just like art, we can. So, so to answer your question, can entre uh, entrepreneurship be taught? I think it's the, exactly the same answer as can art be taught? I think you could uh, teach everybody to appreciate art but I personally believe, and it's just an opinion, much like there are a finite number of da Vinci's or Rembrandt's or Michelangelo's in the world, we could find more of them, but they're not infinite. You can't turn me into a, a Michelangelo. I could learn how to appreciate art and look at paintings and whatever, but I'll never be that person, even with 10,000 hours of practice. I think the same thing is true for founders. I think there's a much bigger pool of Steve Jobs' or Elon Musk's or Reed Hastings in the world that we still haven't found, but they're finite. But we can make everybody else appreciate entrepreneurial culture, appreciate risk and failure, and appreciate the entire ecosystem. And then, so that's the answer to the second part of your question. The first part of your question is, how do you do that art appreciation? How do you figure out whether you have the right skill set? I think you guys are sitting in exactly the right place you know, <laughs> with your background. I think the proliferation of incubators and accelerators and, and, uh, um, and all kinds of entrepreneurial activities where you can actually practice and go, gee, is this a skill set like I, I, I'm good at or I enjoy or can't wait to do in the morning and, and still thinking about when I'm going, up, uh, going to bed? Or is this something which is exhausting because I'm working with crazy people um, and I want a real job and my parents are yelling at me to go work for a bank or, or the government? I think um, there are more opportunities than ever to kind of discover whether this is for you. Uh, I, I hope that maybe kind of answers the, or at least attempts to answer the question. Absolutely. Um, so you're saying that we're sitting in the right place, uh, perhaps even at the right time, but then the question comes sort of naturally, why isn't Milan, San Francisco, or at least right now, and why isn't Italy the Silicon Valley? Um, and how, you know, in a country like Italy, creativity is abundant, but resources can be a little bit more limited, and certainly compared to the Silicon Valley. But what are some tangible steps that our new generations can take to foster entrepreneurial environments that are as fertile as the ones that we see in other entrepreneurial hubs around the world? You know, it's a great question. Why isn't Milan, you know, San Francisco or Silicon Valley? It's you'd be turning the question around. Is why wasn't San Francisco and Silicon Valley the fashion capital of the world? Um, you, you know, seriously. So there's this notion of clusters of industries uh, that have occurred. You know, since there's been commerce. You know, it was Milan for fashion. Then a certain period of time, it was Detroit for uh, automobiles. For it used to be Hollywood for movies, etc. And these clusters have a, con a concentration uh, of people who gravitate there for, um, f for a specific industry, which brings in all these subsidiary industries that needed to support it, bankers and, and finance and, and lawyers and real estate, et cetera, and, and all the subspecialties that are, that are needed. Um, and then the key part that makes Silicon Valley and other entrepreneurial clusters, and then we could talk about Italy specifically, but if you think about an entrepreneurial cluster, um, my definition nowadays, it was different in the 20th century, is it's a cluster if you could raise $100 million for something crazy in that cluster. Um, if you can't, it's not that there are no entrepreneurs, because with the internet, entrepreneurship is everywhere. Every country, every city, every person, everybody with a computer, you have access to you know more computing that existed in the world when I was an entrepreneur through AWS and other, you know, you could get to GitHub and Stack Exchange and, and whatever. You could do 3D printing. I mean, the tools for individual entrepreneurship exist everywhere. And in almost every region or city with sufficient population, you could probably raise a seed round. Uh, that is enough round to get in trouble and maybe, you know, kind of limp, a, limp a, along for a while. But I'll go back to my core definition of that's not a cluster. A cluster are the 10 or 20 places that have a combination of you know, high technology um, research universities. Um, they're a magnet. That is, they're an attractor, not for local people, though local people could apply, uh, 
But people fly or drive there from everywhere in the country and the world to be in that location. And most importantly, and people just kind of forget this if you're an entrepreneur, it, it also attracts what we call risk capital. Equally crazy people willing to bet large sums of money that most of their investments will fail, but one or two will return 10x or 100x their entire fund of investment. Um, just having entrepreneurs is like one hand clapping. So, you know, a, a cluster requires at minimum entrepreneurs and capital at scale and then an entire ecosystem around it. The other piece, of course, and, and, and this is something now I'll get to, uh, Italy specific, it, it has to have a supportive culture. And, and the culture uh, is a culture that appreciates the distinction between entrepreneurship and innovation, which fails most of the time uh, with normal business, which is an execution process. That is, large and existing companies execute known business models and you avoid risk. In fact, you want ever increasing revenue and profit, et cetera. Whereas entrepreneurship, both on an individual basis and a company basis, is a lot of experimentation. It's more like what goes on in a, in a lab. Most of your experiments fail. You have a set of hypotheses, you run some experiments, you know, you get the data and you either modify the, the hypothesis or you invalidate it or you validate it. That's actually what's going on in a portfolio of investments for VCs. But if you don't have a culture, that is, if your parents go, why aren't you working for a large you know, company? Or if your friends go, boy, you know, can't you get a job? Why are you doing this startup stuff? The culture also influences the number of people who will decide to become artists, right? If everybody says artist is a, a dumb thing to do, you'll kind of go where your friends are going. So the culture also kind of influences. Uh, um, and in, in your early age, you're not only influ influenced by early age, I mean your age, you're not only influenced by your peers, you're sometimes influenced by your authority figures, not only your parents, but your professors. And in most universities outside of innovation clusters, those universities are inward facing. That is, they focus on their activities. Gee, I want my students to get PhDs and I want my students to become academics. I want my students to get good jobs. Where in outward facing universities, uh, Stanford, Berkeley, other places in the world, uh, uh, you know, Imperial in, in London, et cetera, people are asking professors, is, how many of your students have done startups? Got any unicorns, you know, of ex students, et cetera. And so you keep different scores. And so the people who influence those generations of students also influence um, how the cluster, uh, how the cluster grows. That's a long answer to a short question, but I think it's not just one component. It's a, it's a series of pieces. Um, by the way, Silicon Valley was an accident. There have been a couple of clusters that were engineered that as people have designed. Um, China in particular, Israel and, and uh, Herzla, um, China's most programs started 12 clusters and about three or four of them have really taken off um, by government design. Other countries have tried to do that, uh, probably a little less successful. And if anybody watching is interested in how Silicon Valley started, there's a video called The Secret History of Silicon Valley. And if you just Google it, you'll get to my a couple of videos I've done on the subject. So I forgot what the question was, but I hope that was somewhat of an answer. <laughs> no, absolutely, Steve, uh, and thanks for the great angle. Um, and, and it's interesting that you touched the, uh, about the culture uh, point, right? This is exactly what we're trying to bring in Italy with a program like Castra, this culture that is essential to foster an ecosystem. Uh, in terms of like uh, going a little more specific and focusing on founders, right? Um, you, along the years, you pointed out that a disproportionate number of successful founders come from dysfunctional families. If you're a survivor of a family that has been operating cows or um, in a difficult situation, you gain the perfect skills to operate in the role of a founder or a CEO. Maybe the common experience you're trying to point out here is an experience of struggle and, re and resilience. Um, you also mentioned in the past that a prime example of this is a foreign student that came from small villages in their home country and made it all the way to great universities, um, perhaps uh, abroad. Some are even the first in their family to go to college. Uh, their life was not easy. In fact, it was like a 20-year training to become an entrepreneur. 
the bottom line is that we don't often realize that our life experiences, especially the toughest one, can also be our unfair advantage rather than an impediment. Do you think these founders have to leave, have to, leave to be successful? How are Italian entrepreneurs or um, um, they are not innovating in the major world entrepreneurship hubs uniquely advantaged in your opinion? Well, let's separate out the, the, I think there are two questions in there. One, one is the question about dysfunctional families and, and startups. Y you know, it, it's not like everybody should come from a dysfunctional, dysfunctional family to become a, a founding CEO. But I should just point out is that survivors of that, that had the brain chemistry for resilience, also have the technique of having been trained very cruelly to shut out everything except the, focusing on those things necessary for survival. That, that description is the job of a founding CEO. Uh, a startup is an, an inherently chaotic environment. There are multiple things coming at you all the time. And your skill set has to be to focus on what are the few that are necessary to move the ball forward to what are the few customers, financial deals, you know, hiring things, et cetera, while at the same time you're the facilities manager and the toilet's overflowing or your biggest customer has just quit or your co-founder, you know, and you got into an argument and you got to fire them and, you know, somebody's stealing your IP and all that happens like between, you know, noon and 3 p.m. in a typical day. Um, if you've grown up with a, an environment that was actually a normal household and you were lucky to have nice parents, that's like new to you and you have to learn those skills ab initio from first principles. But if you grew up in a, in a chaotic environment or you had a struggle to, to get there and, and, and learn how to focus, these things become natural. Um, that's the good news. The bad news, of course, is that these personality traits that get you through the early stage of a, of a company um, turn out to, to be destructive uh, when you find product market fit and scale. Uh, because I've seen multiple founders throw hand grenades into their organizational structure to keep chaos going because they're uncomfortable with, with certainty. And, and for some of you like nodding, you might think, and it's true, it also applies to your personal life as well. You know, if you actually are in a relationship with a normal person and you grew up in a chaotic one, you will start, uh, I see a lot of nodding. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not pointing to anybody in particular, but but it, is, but it is an interesting characteristic about, uh, about founders and that skill set. And you could see it in world-class founders whose names you could probably recognize. And you could then all of a sudden you back up and say, oh, I've seen this model before. A a as for how it applies to Italian entrepreneurs, it gets us into a different question. And the question is, is you know, in this struggle, um, you know, is the promised land of where do I operate? Is it in Italy? or is it inside an existing innovation ecosystem? Um, because you could still do all these great skills of you know, order out of chaos and whatever, but still be in an environment where entrepreneurship isn't recognized, there's no ecosystem, and more importantly, there's no risk capital, there's no mentorship. That's another part of an innovation cluster is you have experienced both entrepreneurs and investors who have seen the movie you know, multiple times and could say, oh, let me tell you what you're about to do. And you go, how do they know that? Well. They don't even have to have wisdom. All they have to have is pattern recognition. Few of them have extracted wisdom out of the pattern recognition. But all you, all you need to is you've seen that movie. If, if you don't have that infrastructure and surrounding folks around you, you're trying to learn all this stuff, you know, again, ab initio from first principles. Um, it's much easier when you have coaches and mentors who say, well, there's a pattern here. Well, let me explain to you what I've seen. You might be maybe unique, but you ought to consider X or Y. Uh, that's the problem in trying to create a cluster from from nothing when you don't have that ecosystem around you as i mentioned earlier though there have been countries that have created it from scratch so it's not impossible but but it takes a concerted effort and to be honest I, I, this is just an opinion i don't think it's possible with just the entrepreneurs trying to will it to be so um it requires government incentives for uh, getting risk capital. It, it requires the elimination of bureaucracy. I'm talking about you, of you Italy right here, about being able to not only start up companies, but to shut them down. Um, there are other countries where, you know, in the United States, if you fail, you kind of wind down your company in three weeks. Trust me, I've had to do that. 
in other countries, it could take years. And that you're personally liable. And there's, you know, all kinds of risks of being a failed entrepreneur. In the United States, and I'm, I have had this happen personally, when you fail as an entrepreneur, and, and trust me, failure is not fun, is regardless of what people say is, oh, we want to fail fast. No, we don't want to fail at all, but we will fail. Um, but if we do, you know, if you're resilient, you'll be having coffee with your friends or investors in another week or two. And you know, what's the first thing that I always used to get asked is, well, so what's your next startup? Not like, yeah, you've shamed your family or we want our money back or whatever. It's like, okay, what are you going to do next? And, and so I remind people from around the world, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are no smarter than those in Italy or anywhere else. It's just that we get multiple shots at the goal and we're supported by a culture that not only accepts that in an innovation, not an execution, but an innovation, failure is part of the game. Um, you know, the other part of our ecosystem, which you'll never notice unless you really start looking with a different set of eyes, is we have what's called a pay it forward culture, which is a fancy word for saying, you know, people who have succeeded before will help you and not ask for anything. That is in other countries and cultures, yeah, you might get some help, but they have their hand out. You know, yeah, I'll give you some advice for 10% of your company. Like, what's that about? In Silicon Valley, you'll have a lot of, a lot of people who, instead of retiring to, you know, the south coast of France or somewhere, somewhere nice in the coast of Italy with a big boat, will actually go invest their time in either teaching or, or investing or coaching or mentoring the next generation. And to... And I think that's pretty special about our culture. Um, and, and what I remind folks is that's easily replic replicable elsewhere. It doesn't require technology. It just requires a shift in a mindset of the people who have succeeded rather than, oh, come to my fancy office. You know, if you're a successful investor or founder in Italy, you should be visibly having coffee with new, new potential startups in a in the cheapest coffee place you could find on the corner. So people see you doing that and you shame your peers into doing that as well. So I'm sorry, I've answered more than you, you asked. And, uh, but I think it's important to kind of describe these, these kind of subtle, but, but, um, but other pieces that contribute to the ecosystem we have here. Yes, absolutely, Steve. And, um, I love that. I love the culture that we have here. I love that no matter who people are and what they've done, they'll respond to an email, they'll talk to you, they'll advise you that that's just invaluable. Um, you know, an example of that is when we were thinking about this and, and how to put it out there, we're thinking about the word give back. And right now that's not translatable in Italian. Really? So we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it, it'd be um, um, a missed opportunity if we had you here and didn't ask you more about uh, the Lean Launchpad method as well and uh, how, it, how it applies to different scenarios. So in particular, um, you know, it was launched and perfected and very successful after the, dot, the dot com boom. But nowadays, a lot of our world's biggest challenges are climate change, global health, like, you know, we're in a global pandemic. So many of these innovations have a very long um, development pipeline and a lot of science risk. Um, so what do you think are new models or tweaks that will be required uh, to allow the development of these types of innovations? Um, and if you were to sort of rewrite the, the Lean Startup methodology today, would that, a consider, would that be a consideration you take in, in mind? Uh, and how would it be different? You know, I think the uh, just m maybe for your the two people who are watching who doesn't don't know what lean is I, let me just back up and, and kind of give a, a 30 second summary lean is just a, a a set of best practices that in hindsight you kind of go really that was transformative well it turns out in the 20th century the way we used to build startups is we essentially said that no you startups you're nothing more than a smaller version of a large company Everything a large company does, we want you to do. They write a five-year plan for a new product. We want you to forecast the future as well. They hire executives on you know, day one, sales, marketing, biz dev. We want you to do that. And by the way, more, most importantly, they specify products and here's all the features for marketing. And then they give it to engineering and engineering locks themselves in a room 
and builds it in a serial process called waterfall and then delivers the product. And, and by the way, we expect in a startup that if you do it that way, the only problem where you're going to have is, is you're building big enough to hold all the bags of money that will come because obviously we built the product to the founder's vision. There it is. Well, it turns out in hindsight, that's kind of silly. Lean is based on the premise that while large companies execute a known business model, startups are actually doing something very different. You're searching for a business model. And a business model is a fancy word for, you know, who are the customers and what features do they want and, and what, how do you, should you price it and, and the regulatory issues and how you're going to get it manufactured and do you need partners. That's what a business model means. And it, it, you become a large company because you figured all that out. But in a startup, the insight I had is you don't know any of that. You, you have a set of untested hypotheses. And that's a big idea. Um, so if you have hypotheses, well, what do you do? Well, you know, if, if you think about it from science, you don't talk to yourself. You run a series of experiments. But the big idea for a startup is there are no facts inside your building. So the experiments you need to run and the data you need to gather is outside your building. I mean, maybe some of the science and tech is, could be done in the lab, but everything else about your business, who are the customers, who are the partners, and how do you price it, and et cetera, that's outside the building. And so we needed a process to actually formalize that, and I invented something called the customer development process. And then one of my students, Eric Reese, said, Steve, in the 21st century, we no longer build products serially, we use something called agile engineering to build products incrementally and iteratively. And when we do that, we could build what's called minimum viable products to test some of the key components in hardware and software. They happen to be what's called product market fit, the fit between the customers and the features they want. Um, in life sciences, actually, it's not the customer that's most important. It might be regulatory issues and reimbursement. But the point is you could very quickly discover some of those key issues and you could do a, a, another thing, which was never possible with a different mindset. You could do something called a pivot. Believe it or not, in the 20th century, the only time we were allowed to change our mind was when we fired a founding VP. <laughs> that is, if, if things weren't going per plan, you fired the VP of sales. Why? Because the plan was the one stable thing. You never change the plan. It must be the salesperson. And then if that didn't work, you fired the VP of marketing. Then eventually you fired the founder because obviously you never fired the plan. The pivot says, no, you know, the facts outside the building don't match our plan. Well, we could try to ship a copy of the plan with every product, but that's kind of ineffective. Maybe we should try to figure out what needs to change. And so the pivot is one of the key ideas about lean. And the, the third piece of, of lean, which is pretty simple, is so what are we testing outside the building? And someone named Alexander Osterwalder came up with a, a single piece of paper called the Business Model Canvas, which kind of has about 80 to 90% of the things that founders need to worry about is who are the customers, what are you building for them? How do you get, keep and grow them? And what's the right way to reach them? Distribution channel, what's the revenue model? What are the key activities you need to become expert at? Which ones do you need to own inside your company? Who do you need to partner with for some of those others? And what are the costs? That's it. Now you get out and you run this process. Um, so now that I told you about Lean, I forgot about your question. Of, uh, what was it? <laughs> My apologies. What was the question? Oh, worries. The question was just, you know, within that framework, what yes. are any modifications, if any, that need to be made for some of the yeah. emergent sectors that are um, deep tech or that have yes. a lot of science innovation behind them? Yeah. And so, so one of the many pivots. So, so one of the funny stories, and and this a lot of this goes back to your research, is when I wrote my first book talking about this methodology, I knew nothing about life sciences, but I just kind of thought, oh yeah, it takes ten to twenty years to do a therapeutic, and and you know it's all about lab science and whatever. And so I said in writing, this process will work for everything but life sciences. The fast forward three years later. I get a call from uh, UCSF, which is a leading biotech school in the United States, that said, we want you to run this class for, for life sciences. I said, well, didn't you read the book? They said, Steve, we are the experts in life sciences. We don't want you to like, you know, figure out like, whether this therapeutic works. But the rest of the business model of how to commercialize that stuff for not only therapeutics, but diagnostics, medical devices, and digital health, 
all that is outside the building activities and we want you to build a version of the class for, for this. And so I got four venture capitalists who all were domain experts in each one of these. We prototyped the class, taught 32 teams in the first iteration, eight in each one of those domains, and then invited the National Institute of Health, the US uh, kind of life sciences government agency in, and they adopted the class. And so pretty soon, in a domain that I thought this would never be applicable turned out to be completely applicable. And this is the backing into your question is in almost every domain, there are unique domain things about it. So for example, as I alluded to earlier in hardware and software, the first things you worry about are product market fit. But for example, in medical devices, even though the ultimate end user might be grandma, you're putting a hip in grandma, <laughs> doesn't buy the hip. She doesn't pay for the hip. She, you know, she can't specify the hip and turns out there are multiple customers. There's a doctor, there's the, you know, insurance company, there's the people giving you the CPT or whatever code you need to get it approved. There's the regulatory agencies and in the U S and then the EU and other places. And, and so turns out there are other things you need to learn, but, but the framework is kind of the same. That's one thing is that you could modify this methodology with domain knowledge to kind of tackle almost every area. We modify the version of the class for verticals. We do hacking for oceans, hacking for energy, hacking for defense, for the Department of Defense and in our intelligence community in the United States. It's now taught in 50 universities. This version of the class, uh, Alana, this lean uh, launchpad class was adopted by our National Science Foundation as well. It's, um, we've put over 5,000 of uh, our country's best scientists and engineers through it. You're taking the original version. Um, at Stanford. Um, so that's one thing. It could be domain specific for whether it was climate or energy or anything else, but you do need to understand the domain so you could give good tactical advice that is trying to give somebody generic advice about therapeutics when they're in medical devices even isn't the same, right? It's just, even though it's life sciences, the how you get liquidity and the things you need to worry about and how you build SABs and key opinion leader is very different. Um, but the other thing that, um, we teach entrepreneurs now um, is this word called liquidity. Even though your goal as a, as a founder might be, I want to change the world or I want to save lives or, you know, whatever, that's not your investor's goal. I mean, they might kind of be vaguely interested in that, but their business is to make an obscene amount of money. And the only way they get to make money is what's called a liquidity event, which is a fancy word for how do I take my worthless stock, which I got in exchange for giving you money, and turn that pieces of paper into the biggest pile of cash you've ever seen. And in the old days, that was through what was called an IPO, at least in the United States, an initial public offering. Or you merged with a, and got merged, you got bought by a bigger company. Nowadays, there's kind of a third activity going on, which are called SPACs, which is kind of a shortcut to a, being a public company. But as a founding CEO, uh, if you take money from someone the key thing that every founder listening and watching needs to understand, the minute you take money from someone, their business model has now become yours. It's a big idea, which says if people are not giving you this money as a gift because they like you, well, they might like you. They're not even giving you a gift because they kind of like your idea. Great. They're giving you this money because they think they can make a ton of money on it. And you need to understand how much money do they need to make? When do they make, need to make it? And what vehicles might they use to, uh, to achieve that? Does that make sense at, at all? Um, so if you're a founder, that's one other thing you need to get your head around is, I thought I'm just raising money and I'm done. No, 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 you're raising money so your investors can make a ton of money. And by the way, if you're smart and own a big chunk of the company, you too will get some of that pile of cash. But you need to understand what those rules are and how not to get thrown out of your own company and you know all the things that could happen to founders. And that's a whole nother series of lectures that hopefully you'll learn in this incubator. Um, did I answer your question? I think I answered more than your question, but. Oh, that was great. Uh, that was great, Steve. Uh, you, you answered a lot of the, the next question that we had. So uh, even better, right? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and skip some of those because uh, thank, thank you for giving, uh, give uh, an overview and a pan panoramic view of like the lean startup approach as well, and then the product market fit and what it, what it is, what it entails and how, how to get there, right? Um, something that uh, we talk a little less about is founder, founder market fit, right? Uh, wh what are your thoughts about this concept? Well, uh, I learned painfully from one of the companies I created, 
is never start or join a company where you find out you hate your customers. Um, you know, I, 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 I accidentally, longer story, I started a video game company and found out I hated 14 year old boys who wanted to play games to kill things. Um, and, and even though I was a gamer, I have to tell you, I haven't played a video game since. It was such a bad experience. And, and this was a company that was the only company I was ever on the cover of Wired magazine for. <laughs> was was the one, and I, the failure left the crater so deep it has its own iridium layer. I mean, that's a. In fact, I learned a ton. In fact, a good chunk of the lean methodology came from the, that failure, less so my successes. Um, uh, so rule one is seriously, if you're not in love with your customers and what you're going to deliver for them, either passion about saving lives or or gee, you can't wait to people use this, or you're engaged with them, et cetera, you're gonna fail, not because of a lack of intelligence on your part, but um, because of a lack of empathy. Um, and I don't mean empathy because you love them personally, but you gotta love what they're doing and what you're gonna do to them or for them or change for them, et cetera, because it requires you to listen and then sometimes listen past to what they're saying to say, well, wait a minute, they're saying X, but really they don't even understand what we could do here or whatever. Um, but, but if you're not engaged in that, um, you know, maybe you could be an execution CEO, you know, when the company's five years old and managing the, the, the finances and whatever. But as a founder, it's really hard not to love talking to customers and learning from them. And, and if someone on the founding team, and I don't mean an employee, I mean a, one of the founders doesn't love doing that I guarantee you have just decreased your odds. I mean, you, you know, random Brownian motion says there might be some that succeed, but, but, but the odds have gone down tremendously. If one of the founders just can't wait to talk to some more people, the other founder who's trying to build the product probably hates it because they say, Hey, look what I found. There was more data. <laughs> no, we need feature three, nine and 12, get rid of the other features and whatever, which by the way, is part of this founding team culture in, in lean, you know, I always did a startup with a partner. I was always the, the entrepreneur. For me, that minimum of founding team has a innovator, an inventor, and an entrepreneur. Rarely it's one person. In life sciences, sometimes it is one person, but in, in that field more than others. But, but that, that two pieces, the one who came up with the tech or the insight or whatever and, and loves to stay in the lab and build it versus the other person, who's creating the reality distortion field to get people to give you money and quit their jobs. And at the same time has the empathy and loves to talk to customers and find out how it might be used, et cetera. Those are the minimum two requirement skill sets that it takes for a company. But those two skill sets need to appreciate each other's job. If you have an a innovator who won't ever leave the building your odds have just gone down as well. And what I mean by that is you don't want to drag them out for every sales call, but assume you've now discovered after talking to 50 people that the six features, number one through six, customers only care about number two to four, you going back in the building and just telling the innovator, get rid of those other features is not going to be a fun conversation. But if in fact they've agreed to go out and listen after not in your first meeting or your even your fifth meeting, but after you hear it 10 times, say, come on out with me. You know, I've been hearing stuff I don't understand. Boy, if you've gotten that relationship pre-wired, they will come back. And that's happened to me driving in the car. I remember this happened. And, you know, like we needed a new feature in this case. And I could have gone into a conference room and like banged the table and whatever, but I took my founder out and we're driving back and he heard all the, the requests from it was like the fifth customer asking for that. I said, finally, Ben, what are we going to do? He said, well, show them page three of the spec. I said, Ben, our spec only has two pages. He said, not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so my co-founder had figured it out because he had the data. So if you think about what you're trying to do, the innovators, is you're trying to make this lean methodology an evidence-based process, not an emotional-based process. Right? You're trying to, again, I'll go back to the lab-based me method or the scientific method. We're trying to get enough evidence and, and, in fact, iterate at a speed that allows the innovators to get aligned with the entrepreneur. Does that make sense at all? That's, sorry about the, uh, about the dig digression. But, but having that team approach and recognizing those skill sets are different 
but making sure they're aligned early on stops this co-founder kind of battle about how to build the very early stage and how to find product market fit. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, thank you, Steve. I, I also didn't know that entrepreneurs moved in Brownian motion. I learned something today. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But uh, you've been really generous with your time um, with us. So we're just going to ask you to, uh, well, one, leave a parting thought to our audience and um, to the Astra participants, as well as innovators and entrepreneurs in Italy. And lastly, we're going to ask you, when are you going to come visit us? Hopefully after the pandemic, but we'd love to see you. We'll bring you to a good oh. Italian restaurant, Steve. <laughs> so... so you know, the, the parting thought is, uh, it took me a while to understand this, um, you know, being a founder, and I want to differentiate, differentiate founder from any other job, you know, early employee, whatever, but being a founder, it's the world's shittiest job. It's terrible, but it is the world's best calling. And, and so if you're not called to this, if you're just thinking it's a job, like I can work at McKinsey or J&J &J or some other, like Google or whatever, Go take the job because your head's not in this. But if you can't imagine doing anything else that you want to see this idea, if you can't, if you just need to get that idea into the real world, you're being called. And what a great time to, to kind of take this call. And so for those of you who are called, congratulations. You've gotten the bug. And, uh, you know, for me, it was a, it was a 20 year career. Um, and and uh, now to answer your second question, I'm almost ashamed to admit that for some reason in the first half of my life, I had no interest at all in visiting Italy. I'll just admit it. And, and then about um, oh, maybe now five years ago, I visited Tuscany and then Pisa and Rome and, you know, and uh, um, Florence. And I have to tell you, I'm in love with Italy. I think it was the friendliest it was great food it was great scenery it was great whatever and i was going boy i screwed up for the you know first half of my life that's one of my major mistakes is missing italy so um um while there's been lots of other places on our bucket list um italy is one of the few places i'd actually go back to again uh, and so i'm i'm waiting for the invitation i've already gotten my second vaccine so i'm i'm ready guys um <laughs> Let me know, and I've now found that. And by the way, I think next year I'm gonna we're gonna spend uh, half a year in London, so uh, I'll be much closer uh, um, to Italy and happy to happy to come over. So thank you for having me. <laughs> well, um, we're very glad that you changed your mind, Steve, uh, along the years, and uh, give us a, a couple of months so that we get a vaccine as well, and then uh, you, you'll receive a formal invitation for sure. Um, well, thank you very much, Steve, for the great chat. It was really a pleasure to have you and catch some of your wisdom. I could have stayed here for the entire day listening to you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is all for today. Uh, we'll ask other great guests in our next appointments. Thanks everyone for watching and stay tuned. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Really, it was very great. And thanks Bye. for your time. <laughs>